My name is Nadine McDonald Dowd. I'm originally from Mackay in North Queensland, which is my mother's country, which is Yubira country, um, which is my mother's family. She's also on my mother's side, South Sea Islander, and um, English as well through her father as well. So there's a bit of a mixed mob there. My father is Scottish, Irish, English. So there's another mixed mob there. So I guess um, I grew up in Mackay all my life born and bred in Mackay, a place called Baker's Creek, and unbeknownst to me, after working here at the State Library of Queensland, where I grew up was actually lo the location of one of the first reserves in Queensland, so Aboriginal reserves that was at um, Baker's Creek called Bridgman Reserves. Mm. Well, the reserves that were set up in Queensland, which historically Queensland has the worst history um, in relation to treatment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, the reserves were allocated areas that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were taken to and held pretty much like a camp. Um, reserves and missions were the same um, kind of concept of isolating Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from each other um, in the hope of, I guess, for want of better words, getting rid of the races. So the history of the reserves and the settlements and missions in Queensland um, was quite horrific and in its treatment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, predominantly a lot of Aboriginal people, and in my case, and my family's case, um, that happened through many generations, and I guess I am a, a product of those many generations. As when they talk about the stolen generations, is that I am a member of, I'm a, I'm a product of the stolen generations. Mm. I think, um, for me, stolen generations are very personal. My mother was taken at the age of two and her sister was taken at the age of 14 months away from their father and placed in a, a Catholic institution that um, was managed by the Sisters of Mercy um, and I would question their mercy in the, the deliverance of managing that space. So my mum was effectively removed at the age of two and, and until the age of 17 she was declared a ward of the state. So I look at my life and I look at my mother's life, which is only one generation away, really, um, and the treatment that she suffered. In this country, I, I think there's still a hesitancy to accept that, that that actually did happen. In 2009, 2008, when the apology was made, um, I think that was, for a lot of people, for, for my mother in particular, it felt like a whole weight had lifted off her shoulders and she had some acceptance over what happened to her happened because it was a black part of our history that we didn't want to talk about. And I, I, I think in a way that the apology was great and I will never take that away from the then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd because for our family it was the start of a big healing period and a, a big period for my mother to finally get some clarity around what happened to her. And, and it wasn't just because she was a half-caste or it wasn't because she wasn't loved, it wasn't because she was ill-treated, it was because she was black. And those, those simply were the reasons of why she was removed. So I don't think in 2015 we're any further along the line of um, looking at the violations of human rights, particularly, particularly in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, because we still don't want to talk about it. I think I surround myself in utopia. I surround myself with like-minded like people um, and I work in a place where history and knowledge is, is being spoken about because we have the capacity to do that. But I think for the everyday Australian, we, we still don't address those violations of human rights effectively in this country. I think it would be great to have a Minister of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs who is actually Indigenous. I think that would go a long way to being able to have somebody who understands not only the not only the people that we're dealing with, but the history attached to that. I think education. I, I was talking to my mum not so long ago about when do we stop being the teacher, and my mother in her 70s said that we never stop being the teacher because until we start changing and embedding it effectively in education, then we're always going to have to teach because our stories still aren't there. You know, that it's slowly, and I think we go to different communities and we travel around to different communities where you can see it happening. But on a larger scale, it's, it's kind of like a sensitised history 
that are still out there. I think there's different mediums now that we can educate through and we need to take advantage of those mediums. We need to have curriculum, we need to have resources and materials that are written by us, for us, about us, in order to be able to, to share that with the wider population as well. And we need to have we need to have a day of remembrance for us. I think, you know, I always used to celebrate Australia Day because that's also a part of my history. That's my father's history. And it's a part of me. It makes up I don't know, half of me. So I, I always used to celebrate Australia Day until about five or six years ago when it just became too painful because of the hate that became attached to Australia Day since the Cronulla riots. So I, I'm really, I, I would like to see that NAIDOC doesn't just, you know, doesn't just have the one week of the year, that we actually as a nation, as a whole nation, not just Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but the whole population stop to remember the First Nations of this country. Because we don't have that. And even NAIDOC is celebrated before and after. The national, or well, it depends on who you talk to sometimes with NAIDOC, because it's the National Aboriginal Islander Day of Celebration. Though, traditionally, it's the National Aboriginal and Aboriginal Islander Day Observance Committee. So, again, but I think, you know, I think the, the, there have been different movements in this country since the 90s where, um, as an observer, I've, you know, I still, I still think the Redfern speech that Paul Keating gave was the start of something important and it could have just been I think if he had stayed our Prime Minister our path of history would have been different I think in relation to government policies and documents around that I think there's more mechanisms today than there were back in my mother's time I think um, for, for me I think I've grown up in a totally urban environment. So I've never grown up in a mission or a reserve, even though we lived across the road from one, that's what the place was. It changed by the time it got settled there, it changed its notion. But I've grown up in community. And I think, you know, the, the mechanism, the strongest mechanism that you have and that we have, I think, is women. Today is education. Um, education has enabled me to be able to be a, a confident black woman um, and to be able to advocate for that. I think there's still, um, I, I look at the young women that are coming through education now and that are not only completing grade 12, they're going on to university, they're doing their masters, they're doing their PhDs in things that I would never have even thought were possible. So what they're doing is using education to be able to change the face of Aboriginal women. And you know, we're no, we have a certain role in our community. We have a certain role in our families that we can't switch off after a nine to five job. We embed, that, that's just a part of who we are. But the, the changing face that I see of women in, in really strong, powerful positions has come through education and being able to have access to education, to change education, to use education to better inform non-Indigenous people of our culture, how we see ourselves. Um, for example, there's a young girl I know who is doing her PhD in contemporary Indigenous fashion and looking at how previous notions of contemporary Indigenous fashion has, has been, I, for want of a better word, bastardised through commercial, com commercialism. So she's looking at the practice of how do we maintain cultural integrity in commercial art practices. And I find that amazing. I would never have thought that that would have even been possible. Um, so I think, you know, education is a big tool that is being utilised a lot more. And I see we have celebrations here at Coral Dargan where we see Year 12 leavers who have come from, you know, pretty rough families and rough positions and community. And they're the first in their family in 2014, 2015 to complete education, to finish high school. And for me, that's one appalling that we're still, you know, having to have those issues of our own mob finishing a decent high school education to learn how to read and write to, to have those basic essentials to to live. 
but it's also amazing that the young people are driven enough to be able to want an education because it's a way of having another different tool on our warrior belt to get us through the next phase of whatever, you know, whatever the next generations want to do. I'm the, my current position here is manager of Kuril Dargan. So Kuril Dargan is the um, indigenous space on level one. So essentially it's a, a, a space where we showcase the diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture, language, history in Queensland. We focus predominantly on Queensland. International, um, Queensland national and international audience. So the work that we're able to do is about uncovering some of those untruths, uncovering the histories that aren't so nice, um, but being able to showcase them in a way, whether it be through exhibitions, through public programs, through workshops, children's programs, reading programs, literacy programs. So to a wider audience so that they have a better understanding of our history. And it's, um, it's a, I guess it's a, the engagement is a lot softer, <laughs> um, but it's, it's as powerful. And, and so the, the whole idea also is that the work that we create is collected. So as a library and as a collecting library and a collecting institution, that that knowledge is held for future generations to come. When I first started working here, there was like a little folder that contained all of the, um, the relevant Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander history. And that was just a little document that was about this big. So I would like to think that by the time that I leave, that would have tripled because 90% of the work that we create here is created by community. It's community telling their stories. So, because we've we don't have that history in the, in the collection. We had an exhibition here about four years ago called Flash Women. And while it was about women in fashion, it was also about the empowerment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. Our beauty, our knowledge, our wisdom, our physical beauty, our strengths, our courage. And so from that exhibition alone, we had a lot of women give up their time to tell their stories, um, to share their experiences. And I think it's that what came out of it for a lot of the young ones that were involved in that process is about having a certain strength in yourself as one, as an Aboriginal person, but as an Aboriginal woman. And we look at our mothers and our mother's mothers and we look at their treatment. And I look at my mother and, and my mother is always my role model. Mm. My mother, you know, had, had, had been through a, a strong life, but also a pretty horrendous life as well. So the, the, whole, the whole idea of, of you, you know, having her as a role model in my life to help me inform myself as a strong woman is, is really important. And, I, I, you know, I, we've worked with um, some of our Maori sisters and some of our First Nation sisters from, um, you know, America and Canada. And while we're half a world away from each other, we share the same experiences. Mm. And there's a different knowing to being a First Nations woman walking on this country than there is to being a settled woman on this country. There was a really interesting conversation um, that was broadcast on NITV a few weeks ago about the role of Indigenous women. And I found it, I found it really interesting because there were so many different demographics across that panel. Tanya Major um, spoke about loving our women. And for me, when I've gone out to community sometimes and I see how domestic violence um, and drug and alcohol abuse has um, impacted our community, and these things were never there before settlement, and how deeply it has impacted on our women in community, that's for me, a, a big human rights issue and, and how we perpetuate that and how, how do we stop that cycle. And quite often people will say it's a, it's a black issue. It's actually not. It's a societal issue. Domestic violence is a societal issue. And we can't turn a blind eye to it. And our women cannot be victims anymore. And how do we, how do we, how do we better that 
from the inside out, not the other way. So instead of having policy enforced on a community, you will do this, you will do that. How do we better listen to the needs and the wants of every community? Every community is different, and that issue has impacted on our community in multiple different ways, and each community has its own needs. So one size doesn't fit all. I'm not, I don't know what the answer is to that. There's simple things I think that we could do, and simple things that we've tried to do, and, and working with those communities and those community groups in you know, giving them an opportunity to share their stories, and which is what we've done through programs and exhibitions here. And just simple things. Like, I, I really agree with Tanya is that, you know, a lot of white men love their women. They want them to get dressed up and, you know, do their hair and makeup and wear those beads and wear their high heels. It's gorgeous. Why can't it be the same for our women? It's a really interesting... I, I don't know what the answer is, but I... You know, I, I've been told many times when I go to community, dress down, cover yourself up, wear long clothes, don't do anything fancy. And predominantly a lot of the time that's by non-Indigenous people. It's very interesting because I, this is me. This is the way I am. This is the way that I was raised by my mum, to never stand in the shadows, to always be strong. Dress the way that you feel is, is great for you. Get your hair done, get your eyebrows done, go for your massage. You know, this is, these are things that I've been taught and I would love to be able to teach that to our young women as well. Simple things. Every night off year, we have a jersey. A jersey that makes you look like a front row. You know, a front roller. It makes you look like a man. These jerseys, that, and they're great. They're beautiful and vibrant. Where's the, where's the jersey for women? That, that enables us to be women. You know, it's, it's a, that's a really simple thing. I hate them every time they come out. Like, I like the designs, but I will not buy one because I don't want to look like a man. I don't want to look like a front rower with my collar up. I want to look like a woman. I want a V-neck. I want something slim-fitting that makes me look like a woman, a lovely woman. You know, our women are beautiful. We've got evidence, you know, that we need to... We need to we need, as a community, to love our women. And I totally agree with Tanya Major. I think she made a really strong point, and she lives up home. That's the voice from community, you know. It's a, we need to listen to, to that a little bit more, I think. <laughs>